Hi folks, we're in the process of setting up two new machines here at our shop. Uh, well, they're technically not new, but we have a VF2YT. It used to be sort of our R&D general purpose overflow machine, and we're repurposing it with a series of our puck chucks to be our aluminum dedicated machine for all the Saunders Machine Works aluminum products, which range from soft jaws to the hobby mod vice to our 12 by eight pallets, um, as well as our kind of offshoot company, Shimt Works, where we're designing and making uh, mostly air-cooled Porsche valve covers and other mostly aluminum style parts like that. If you followed along our journey, especially over on the Business of Machining podcast, uh, you'll know that we used to run all of our aluminum products on our Okuma MB4000 horizontal, which honestly ran absolutely great. But uh, our strap company really does not want us to provide mixed material anymore because they can't sort it and they it becomes truly trash. And all else equal, I would rather both get some money for our scrap, but also um, have our scrap be able to be recycled. That is a good thing. And so after spending a fair amount of time looking into various sorting options, of which I assure you, I did a lot of research into magnetic sorting, automated sorting and so forth. The easier answer, practically speaking, is simply to separate uh, aluminum and steel onto different machines. That has the benefit as well as opening up some capacity on the horizontal for growth, which, which I think is very much appropriate and will be, will be good. Uh, and there's also kind of a weird thing with the horizontal, which is a very expensive, machine that's critical to our operation and it would be silly to have a goof on it if you're doing some inexpensive small aluminum part. So I actually like uh, very much the aluminum being over on this VF2 YT. Um, it has the benefit, number one, we already had the machine, but also it has 50 tools and between the high tool count, relatively high tool count for a VMC and the puck chuck setup, it's going to be an absolute awesome machine. So I wanted to show today um, some of the workflows that we're starting to integrate around the VF2 YT for tooling and cam and so forth, as well as talk a little bit about our uh, relatively, again, sort of new to us, if you will, uh, UMC 350. We had bought this machine for use over at our training facility. And unfortunately, our training instructor, Vince, was absolutely awesome, moved to Arizona. And for now, uh, the short answer is we're focusing on what's going on here at Saunders Machine Works. So we're not able to do our training classes right now. And rather than sell this machine, I thought, you know what, this could be a great machine to backstop in the fact that we need a general purpose R&D machine that's kind of free to use, that's free to use for tooling, one-offs, fixtures. I'm actually running a fair number of Johnny Five parts on it right now. Uh, and honestly, on a kind of a personal note, it has really re-sparked my passion and love for machining because having a machine set up correctly where you can drop a part in, you get really good cam, you get five access parts that are able to be done, and you have a really well done tool library. It's probably the biggest key to this that I'll talk about in this video. Uh, it just puts a giant smile on my face. It's really, really cool. So let's start quickly with the VF2. Um, Alex took the lead on the setup and the puck chucks. So we have a root file here in a folder that's called VF2 -Y SSYT master assets. And it has this setup file. So we can grab that as needed, as well as our master cutting tools file. So this really speaks to a what I think is a pretty frustrating and major shortcoming in Fusion 360, which is that you don't have a way of creating a tool library that shares tools across separate files. So the simple example would be, let's say we have 10 different Fusion files that make parts on the VF2 and they all use a through spindle coolant drill. If that drill happens to break and the only replacement I have on hand today is a non through spindle coolant drill, there isn't an easy way uh, unless without you know pulling out uh, sheets, opening a bunch of files, tribal knowledge, et cetera, of knowing, oh, we need to go into these 10 programs, check this tool and turn off the through spindle coolant option. That way it doesn't deadhead the pump and potentially blow a bearing, et cetera. Basically, I wish Fusion had a master library that the tools always pulled from all the time. And that simple answer is that doesn't exist today. So what we try to do is we create a separate file uh, called master cutting tools. This requires a fair amount, uh, a burden on the operators, uh, me and the others to keep this up to date, which is not easy to do. Um, it's not as much of a worry for us on the VF2 because we'll only be using this machine on a limited number of parts uh, that'll be effectively production oriented. And they're all aluminum. They actually share a lot of tools. So basically not as worried about it. It's a little bit trickier of a problem on the UMC because 
uh, for example, if you need to change the stick out of a tool or you need to change the holder, those things really matter on five axis. Uh, so that's all the more reason a master library is sacred. Um, the benefit though is that we won't be doing a lot of repeat jobs on the UMC. So as long as when you tool up or program up a new part, if you grab it from the library, the master library, if you will, um, then you should be okay. Um, for the VF2, we aren't really storing production files in the folder. We're usually putting those in our Saunders machine works, for example, Modvice, Gen 3, and I'll pull up the cam here, say, for example, for the soft jaws. And this is what that looks like. So it's a great example of a zero point system. Uh, we're obviously using our own Saunders machine works puck chucks, but other folks make zero points as well. Um, and it shows us the ability to drop the, um, we have our fixture plate, permanently mounted, puck chucks are permanently mounted, but then these fixtures can be pulled on and off really in a matter of five or 10 seconds. And here on the front fixture, we have a, a quantity 12 op ones. And in the back we have, uh, actually I think I got that back mixed up here. The back we've got 12 op ones and the front we've got 12 op twos. So it's a really good kind of quote unquote one piece flow where we can pop these two fixtures on, everything's located, there's no need to do any probing, and you can start running soft jaws as needed. And in a matter of seconds, you could pull these off and switch over to say the 12 by eight pallets. Similar workflow on the front here, we've got the base fixture, which again pops right on and off with our op one material. And on the back, we've got op two with two parts as well. The real trick here is just programming. I really like using the duplication pattern in Fusion Cam when I'm doing multiple parts on fixtures like this. So again, pattern type is duplication. You pick the, a specific point on the first instance, and then you pick the same point on the other part. There's some major advantages to this. First is that if I want to move the actual location of this part over by a few thousands of an inch or, or any amount, I can do that in the CAD side and it saves those changes in fusion. I can kind of see what the design and the intent was of it versus having to do just a component pattern where you just fit, have fixed spacing in fusion, uh, like this linear pattern, et cetera or having each part be a different work offset. First off, you can just run out of offsets, but that means, especially on a part fixture with like 20 or 30 parts, you've got to use 20 or 30 offsets, you've got to probe each one in, and it can be very cumbersome to track or update offsets. The other really nice advantage of this is it makes it really easy if you want to skip one or any number of the patterns. So if you've got 20 of these parts and you only want to rework seven, we've all been there, uh, you can just click quickly, click and unclick the points and you get the kind of cam tool pass you want. For the tooling on this machine, uh, aside from having a quote unquote master library that we pull from, uh, we also use a Google Sheets file. This is our master machine tool info card. So each of our machines has a info sheet. We've shown this in prior videos that shows uh, the serial number, service number, information, et cetera, on the machine. So that's all in one overall Google Sheet file. And we also have started including other relevant information like first off the offsets. So here we have a screen grab of our puck chuck setup with the circular uh, a red circle around what we call G54P5. In the prox values, we don't use those values. We would reprobe if we had to, but that's a sanity check if somebody wants to make sure um, they weren't changed. And the same thing with our G54P6. Uh, and this is laminated on the machine. And the tool list, this is, uh, I present this with, with a dose of humility because these things are really good at getting out of date. But again, because this is a purpose, purpose use aluminum machine for production stuff, um, I think this will go better than, uh, we've not struggled with this in the past. Uh, so as we're adding tools, we put them in the master library and we create this sheet here, we update it, we print this out periodically, put it on the uh, front of the machine. And it's a really helpful way to do a sanity check as well as, as if somebody's starting with a new, um, f a new part to program up, they might reference this as well as again, the master tool library. Uh, the better example of this though is probably the UMC 350. This is all still a work in progress. There's some major things that we want to accomplish with this workflow around the tooling, the post, and the container method cam setup. Uh, if you have not watched uh, a video by Rob Lockwood from Autodesk University called Streaming cam Streamlining Cam Workflows, um, this is from 2019, so there have actually been some good updates to Fusion since then, but it's absolutely still a relevant video. And Rob walks through uh, a workflow that, that he really is responsible for coming up with, and it's an absolutely great workflow. The very short punchline is you create Fusion files and you have it's, it's model, so that would be where you actually put your workpiece or part that you're gonna machine. 
You have a separate container or component for the fixture, and you have a separate one for parametric stock. And that's the basics of it. Rob shows in his video the ways this is done well, including things like the parametric stock is controllable by user parameters. So if we have a part that's now two inches wide, you hit two inches and you'll notice the jaws opened, the stock changed, and even this part right here, this little pedestal, which is actually part of the model, and that's used if you want to use a five axis workflow where you want to have that serve as a quote unquote part of the model, but really what you're doing is you're telling Fusion Cam, don't machine into that, uh, and it's really useful for pedestal style machining where you want to just do the top of the part before you machine the bottom away, or window or window frame style machining. As a great example of that in progress, um, we're, we're, we're really not even done yet. You notice I've got the vice, the wrong vice here because the jaws are inverted. That's okay for this part. But I needed to make two Johnny Five parts. They're discontinued hydraulic parts. I dropped this model in. Um, some of these tool paths are already here and saved. That ties in with the tool library as well. And you kind of click go. And not only do we get code that works and simulates really quickly, but uh, it's a little bit taxing here with screen recording software while I'm doing it, but if I simulate it with the machine itself, and that's really easy on a lot of the common machines because Fusion already has all these solid models available, um, you get full-blown machine simulation. I don't really care about showing the base, so I'll turn that off. But most importantly, when I'm doing things like parting off, I can now very quickly see I've got, you know, frankly, miles of clearance on that last operation. Um, the next step is I believe Fusion has already released the ability to do this sort of simulation along with the linking moves. Um, that's a much, deep dive, much deeper dive conversation about are you simulating the G-code or simulating the um, CAM operations. The difference being the G-code is what happens after the, the CAM has been run through your post-processor. And that's really what you want to be simulating because you want to know if things like linking moves or tool changes could cause any sort of a crash uh, on the machine. Um, that I believe that stuff is coming. I'm not sure which sort of variant or version of it um, in Fusion, which will be really helpful to sort of understand and see linking moves, as well as to control them. That way, for example, if you're doing uh, 500 holes along a sphere, you don't have to necessarily do a full retract all the way to your safe position or your home position. Um, you can do a shorter retract to save a lot of time, but of course also be safe. Um, the biggest project for me right now on the UMC 350 is tooling. So big limitation of this machine is that it only has 18 tools. I plan to overcome that by doing uh, a mix of ATC tools and manual tools. The way we're doing that is changing the default tool change, which would be like T4 M6 to change the tool four. I'm replacing that in the post with a, uh, I believe it's a macro, not a subroutine, but it'll be uh, 9006 and I'll, I'll keep this short right now partly because I don't have it totally working yet so uh, I can't stop you guys from like looking at the screen and, and rewriting this yourself but just sit tight we'll get this working and we'll share all of it um, but there are four different scenarios the first would be auto to auto that means the tool that's being used and the next tool are both in the tool changer that's basically like no running the normal uh, ATC equipped uh, CNC machine the other extreme would be manual to manual. That means the tool that you're using right now was manually loaded into the spindle, and the next tool is manually loaded into the spindle. What this will let me do is have up to 200 tools with the offsets stored in the Haas control. That way I can run programs where I've got 18 tools ready to go and the program can use those common tools all day long, but uh, because it's a prototype machine, R&D machine, I don't care if it stops and says, oh, you know what, I need tool 74, which is a 1032 form tap, and somebody, me or anybody else, has to manually load that tool. That's okay. As long as that tool is set up offline, it's right next to the machine, has a tool tag on it, the height is stored, that's a real win. And so the middle two scenarios are the more complicated ones. Uh, the first one being where the tool that's in the spindle needs to go back into the tool changer, thus you need to leave the spindle empty and then prompt the user to manually load the next tool. And the next scenario is the opposite. The tool that's in the spindle needs to be manually removed, the spindle needs to be left empty, then you hit cycle start or something and it then proceeds to load a tool from the ATC into the spindle and resume the operation. There is a huge risk to this whole thing, which is that Haas machines don't have a tool present sensor in the spindle so there's nothing that's ever going to stop me or anybody from failing to remove the tool manually hitting cycle start and causing the tool changer to tool change a new tool into a spindle that already has a tool so I'm still grappling grappling with that I wish Haas would let us program 
the rapid rates down or even safe mode via MRG codes. I don't believe they do. That way you could have a 5% crash instead of a 100% crash. Um, so I'm still chewing on that. We also have a weird uh, potential crash alarm happening, which I think is a quirk on the UMC, not this code itself. Um, but that's what this does. It looks at what whether the tool is numbers one through 18, in which case it does the ATC. Um, and if not, it does the custom code to invert that. But again, I'm really excited about this because it means you got that kind of dream scenario, a small five axis machine where you've got a number of tools in the ATC and you've got every tool you could possibly want. Yes, I got to pay for holders and set them up, but that's, a, that's an investment I'll make all day long because now I've got that quirky Harvey lollipop tool or that Lakeshore bullnose for surfacing or the Haas tooling uh, steel rougher for long, you know, long three eighth inch rougher. Um, and I've got that in a fusion library uh, again, there's the library weakness side of this, which I can't overcome other than the UMC library. We are being more deliberate with how I build it out. So I'm doing a good job and thorough job at typing in the description, the vendor, the ID, uh, the cutting information. And then a lot of that is replicated in a Google Sheet uh, doc here, which has more rich information. So I think we were just looking at tool two. So if you look at tool two, that's a 316, so that's the, it's a 1.2 one inch stick out in a Mari Tool 5.0M holder. Um, I've already 3D printed the bin for extra tools of those. It's already in the ATC. Here's a link to buy more tooling. These will be my tools that live in the ATC. And then I'm gonna start populating the manual tools uh, this way. And again, complementing them with 3D printed tool tags. We'll also probably end up lasering some of the manual tool bodies with the tool number on them. That's kind of a permanent label, but I like that for the way we're gonna use this machine. So as always folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed. If you guys have comments or better workflow ideas, I'm for sure open uh, to that. Throw them in the comments below. Otherwise, take care, see you soon.